I have Jane Flaherty with me, and I appreciate you, Jane, sitting in for our lunch and learn and being presenter today. The information that you shared was invaluable, and I just want you to do a little bit of a recap because there is a ton of information. But if you could just talk about some of the key things that you find important in terms of people really having control over what they want to control and, and spending energy doing those activities that are most valuable. Sure, I'm happy to. Thanks for um, having me. I'm so glad that the first Zoom meeting I did was with all the women of Wynn. It was nice that the women of Wynn came and did that. And even women who aren't with Wynn, and you've opened up all of our Zoom meetings and Lunch and Learns to all women, whether they're members or not. And, and thank you for that. That's terrific. Well, my topic today was estate planning. And estate planning, it's not about taxes. It's about control, and it's about kindness. Kindness to yourself and kindness to your loved ones on it. And um, I talked through what basic estate planning documents were. Uh, for healthcare, there's HIPAA waiver and healthcare power to living will. For finances, a durable financial power of attorney. And then of course, your last will and testament. We also talked on uh, titles to deeds and real estate issues, which are our big assets. And then I went through each document a HIPAA waiver and healthcare power, what, how, what they do, and then how you use them and what they're used for. And, um, and then we had some, we reviewed assets and titles, and then we had some Q&A. And I appreciate the questions some of the women had uh, on there and the input it was terrific. So I will do that now on a HIPAA waiver. So HIPAA waiver is a federal statute and it allows people to communicate with doctors, getting information only. There's no decision making here. And on a HIPAA waiver, you really wanna put the people who are your first responders, your, your spouse, your kids, your friends, your parents, those types of things, who would be the one running to the store to take care of things? Who would get on the phone and argue with the insurance company for you? Those type of people you want on your HIPAA waiver. It's only information, no decision making. And that's, I use a separate form in my practice because that form is valid for two years after your passing. And so that's a HIPAA waiver. Plus, if you have a large family, you might not want, you might want all of them to be able to talk to your doctors or insurance people or schools or colleges, but you don't want them making decisions. So it's a good way to include all the people that you care about and have them feel included. So that's HIPAA. The next is healthcare to make a decision if you can't make it yourself. So a healthcare power, when we were all younger, people could just say, no, take care of this or do that, but now you can't. A doctor in a hospital needs to have legal, the legal authority to allow you to make a decision for someone else. So as soon as that person is 18, you need that healthcare power. My children turned 18 and I said, happy birthday, honey, sign here, sign here, sign here. And they gave me HIPAA rights and healthcare rights, living will rights, and a financial power right on there and they've done the same for us they're like well if we're you can talk to the doctors about me i should be able to talk to the doctors about you so i need your HIPAA and your health care mom and dad so we did that as well if you have minor children and you have care workers or grandparents or in a blended family you need to have a hipaa a health care and a financial for all of your minor minor children giving that to someone else so that was hipaa Health, healthcare is the decision making. So that's making a decision if you're not able to make it yourself. And that is um, with doctors. And I use a form that's called for the state of Ohio. It's an advanced directive form. It's clunky, it's inelegant, it's very informative. And if you have a hard time sleeping, read through every bit of it. Um, but it is easily recognizable by everyone. As soon as you walk into that hospital, they are gonna know you're in charge, they're gonna know it's valid, they're gonna start listening to you right away. So I use those healthcare powers and living wills. So a healthcare power is only effective if you're not able to speak for yourself or make a decision for yourself. And um, what else do we need to tell you on the healthcare power? That's what that's for. So you are in a, somebody's in an accident, and you need to be speaking for them and you're bringing them into the hospital, they'll listen to you. If they're incapacitated, think of someone with special needs or someone who's incompetent, they need you to speak for them. And that's, that's how you would use that. 
the living will, which is the second part of that power, that's um, oddly named because it's not a will, but if you think through it, it's a living will. It's valid while you're alive. And what the living will does is it gives your agent the power to enforce your decision you make while you're well and alive now. So let's say that you are in the hospital, you're in a permanently unconscious state, two doctors have said there's no chance of your survival, and um, you've told people while you were alive and well that you don't want to live like that. You want them to remove all the machines and see what God has to say about it. And so that um, document that you sign allows your agent to enforce that. They will never ever remove comfort care. So there wouldn't be pain involved. Comfort care would always be on there. So that is a living will. So those are the three healthcare documents that I think are basic healthcare documents. The next healthcare document, or the next document is a financial power of attorney. So the healthcare power where you can make healthcare decisions for someone else, where they can make them for you, is sort of like being the guardian of a person. You decide what they can eat and where they live and where they go to school. Well, a financial power is the equivalent of a guardian of the estate. It allows you to pay for that. So you're gonna give someone the authority to make financial decisions for you. Now, my healthcare powers, I make them durable, which means they're valid now while you're alive and well and competent, and they're valid if you ever have a period of incompetence. Mm -hmm. This is critical because if you do become incompetent, a healthcare power and a financial power will prevent you from needing to have an adult guardianship in the probate court. That said, a financial power is a really powerful document, a lot of damage is done with it, and I want to talk you through how to use it and why. And then we talked about a last will and testament. Most people know what that is, and people call me all the time, Jane, I need a will. I don't have a will. The purpose of a will is for the probate court to determine who would be guardians of your minor children, who you would name as executor of your estate. It waives bond, so no one has to pay basically insurance to make sure they don't steal your assets of your estate. And it decides how your assets are gonna be distributed. It's really important to know that the will is effective only after your death. So the last will you sign will be the will that applies. Uh, the probate court validates that will names your executor, and monitors and approves all the distributions of your estate. Your will is a written document and it overrides a statute in the state of Ohio. So Ohio has a statute, so if you don't have a will right now, or if you've never signed a will, no, the state of Ohio has one for you. And the state of Ohio tells exactly, lays out exactly how your assets will go at your passing. And for some families, it's perfect because they've only been married once, they've only had children from one person, or they still have family members alive. But if you ever got married more than once, had a child from somewhere else, have a family that you really don't want them to inherit, have a special needs child, um, have been with a life partner but never married legally, you really need to have a will to make sure the people you want to get your assets get your assets. So those were the five documents, but truly for me, the number one way that you can take control is how you title your assets and how you name or designate beneficiaries on your assets. So we discussed the six basic assets types. They were bank accounts, brokerage, stocks, bonds, those types of things insurance policies, whether that's medical, life, property casualty, a personal, t um, personal rider, um, long-term care insurance, any types of insurance there are. Uh, cars, we talked about insurance. Motor vehicles, these can all be titled and it's not just a car, it's also a dirt bike and a motorcycle and an RV and the trailer. Um, those types of things. Many people think um, it's just a car or even a clunker, but it's not the value of the estate. Remember, it's not about taxes. It's not, it's about control and kindness. So if you have everything in order and you die and all you have is a $2,000 Chevy Vega, 
that person still has to go to court to get that um, put in their name um, and get it out of your estate. Unless there are some some exceptions and everything, you have you're married, then spouses can just can um, get a car from a decedent uh, just through the BMV without going to probate court. There's exceptions with that. And we talked about real estate. Lots of rules on real estate. It's different than just titling um, things. And then we talked about retirement plans. So with retirement plans, there's tax advantaged issues there. Some laws changed in December of 2019 about distributions of retirement plans. So you want to look at how your beneficiary designations are titled on your retirement plans. And then the number one thing I wanted to do was leave everyone with things that they can do right now. How you can take control right now. Um, I know it's an odd thing to say, but being home is a blessing in so many ways. And one is that you can go through that paperwork that sometimes is such a pain to do. So take out the front page of every single asset you have. Look at how it's titled. Is it in your name only? And then we'll think through what that means at your passing. If it's in only your name and no one has any powers for you and there's no den beneficiary designation, it's a probate asset. If you have it jointly with someone else and you pass, that, that uh, asset goes to the other people named on that bank account or brokerage account. And you may have put their name on there for convenience or you may want them to inherit it all. So think through that. Or you could do something called a payable on death or transfer on death designation. So you keep all the control while you're alive, the account's just in your name, but at your passing, it goes to someone else. So Jane, I'm gonna stop you here because I want yeah. About something that I think is really important right now. So there's a lot of fear um, and fear can drive people to make decisions that are not necessarily the best. So I've already seen online where some people that I know have gone and done their wills on legals, whatever it is, online. Um, talk about some of the mistakes that that can cause for you. Sure. Um, first, I get the fear and I get wanting to get it done online, especially in this environment. And so I applaud the proactive nature on taking care of things. Um, but I would really suggest that you find <clears throat> an attorney that you know or recommended to, or you can ring me and talk through a few things. You may want to leave it to your kids, but or a sibling, predeceasing. You have to think through a lot of steps. It's a weird feature of my life. I think through every scenario. I don't always talk about them, but if you um, have a blended family, if you two of you were married, divorced, and each brought kids to the family, unless you have a will written right, those children won't inherit equally. Maybe you don't want them to, but you need to put it in writing so that comes out right. Most importantly, if you have a uh, beneficiary who has special needs, if that person inherits from you, it throws them off of their benefits until they have their assets down again. So there's many pitfalls on these. If you leave it to a person and um, they're married and end up getting divorced, is it going to be an asset that's part of the divorce? There's lots you just have to, to think through on there. And it's good to talk to someone who has some experience in this area on that. And those are all things that something done online, you don't necessarily have those scenarios put before you to be able to put those in a will if you're doing it by yourself online. So really important. And that's why we appreciate you so much, Jane. <laughs> so Thank much. you. Another I'm part gonna of let you go, but I want you to any any you know last minute words of wisdom <laughs> you want to share. Yeah. Um, so estate planning, again, it's not about money. If you have over $5 million, you have other issues to take care of, but most people don't. And it's, it's really about kindness and control and thinking through because you love the people you love. And after you're gone or if you're incapacitated, it's so nice to have laid out what you want done so they don't have to worry about it. And they can work together collaboratively to take care of you or remember you rather than fight about it and wonder what's going on. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. Thank you so much, Jane. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Yolanda. Thank you so much, Wynn Cleveland.